Today I'm going to talk about blood testing, heart disease, and cholesterol. I did a five-year PhD on the topic of cholesterol and sex hormones at Boston University Medical School. I spent five years thinking about cholesterol as a full-time job, so this is my wheelhouse. Unfortunately, I can't literally summarize everything I learned in five years in a five-minute video. It's impossible, even though some people will expect that. I also don't do videos as a full-time job, so there's that. But I will tell you what I honestly think, and I have no financial motivation to be biased on this. I just want people to avoid prescription drugs as much as possible because all artificial man-made drugs have side effects. And I honestly just want you to be healthy, especially as you get older. Our country needs an upgrade in health and vitality. It starts with knowledge. So it's important to note here that older age doesn't allow your body to bounce back from poor diet or nutrient deficiencies or hangovers or other shenanigans. So it's more important than ever as you age to understand all this information. So let's start with age. As we get older, average total cholesterol goes up. Around age 20, your total cholesterol on a blood test is usually about 165 or 170. By the time you're 50, the average is about 200. That's basically a normal person. The data also shows your hazard ratio for dying, your risk of dying, really only starts going up once you get over 300 on your total cholesterol on the blood test. There are obviously individual variations with individual people, and the question of whether a person is healthy or not is important, but in general, lower cholesterol is actually a higher hazard ratio, a higher risk of dying from heart disease, dying from cancer, dying from literally any cause of death, especially if you get super low on your cholesterol, like when you dip below 160 on your total cholesterol. Keep in mind here that your sex hormones, men and women, are made from cholesterol. So when your cholesterol goes super low, your sex hormones virtually always decline compared to when you raise your cholesterol high by eating a lot of saturated fat. This is why people with low cholesterol almost always feel much better when they raise their cholesterol. As uh, their sex drive goes up, their energy goes up, their motivation goes up, then doctors say, oh, you're doing so bad. <laughs> you now you have energy, you know it's wrong. A good example of this is a vegan diet. Vegans usually have super low cholesterol because they don't eat saturated fat. And conventional doctors are correct on this. Saturated fat, this animal fat, definitely does raise your cholesterol. It's usually not a bad thing like they tell you, but it does raise your cholesterol. But we'll talk about that in a minute. The take home message here though, is that age raises your cholesterol on average. Age also makes you more vulnerable to health issues. So people often assume as your cholesterol goes up, your risk of health problems goes up because cholesterol goes up with age, whether you're healthy or unhealthy. Doesn't mean you're gonna ruin your health as you age, but all those preservatives stacked up in our diets, all those processed foods, all that high carb nonsense, soaked with seed oils, all that stuff is worse for your health as you age. It amplifies with age. So if you do a population study, you see people with higher cholesterol, older people tend to have higher levels of heart disease, but it doesn't mean that cholesterol is causing the problem. But here's another layer to this. In general, the more you research this topic and the deeper you understand the research on this topic, the more you find that inflammation is truly what causes damage to the arteries. Cholesterol comes and fixes the damage, but it's always inflammation that triggers the damage. For example, I've seen a lot of cigarette smokers that have extremely low cholesterol because they're on cholesterol-lowering statin drugs, and they still have heart attacks, sometimes multiple heart attacks, all with super low cholesterol. It's because of all that cigarette smoke inflammation in their bloodstream for so many chronic years. I used to do autopsies for years and years, I'd go to the morgue every Thursday. You find all kinds of plaque in those people's arteries, yet their cholesterol is 110 for decades. Why? Inflammation. <laughs> because inflammation damages their arteries. Even though their cholesterol is super low, there was still enough cholesterol around in their bodies to fix the damage. What's interesting to note here, to add here, is that people that smoke cigarettes have less heart attacks on statins than people that smoke cigarettes that are not on statins. So how does that work? It's because inflammation is damaging the arteries, but having lower cholesterol in those cases slows down the, the body's ability to patch up those damaged spots on the arteries. They still get plaque in the arteries from all that chronic inflammation. It just takes longer to grow those plaques when cholesterol is suppressed. What's the real solution in this case? Take lots of statins? No, the real solution is to stop smoking cigarettes. What about cases where people don't smoke? 
Well, the problem with our modern food is we have loads of this nonsense in our foods and medical organizations deny this is a problem. I did a video recently about plastic chemicals called phthalates in our foods, for example. And then there's the preservatives, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, molds. They're all in our foods. Europe has stricter law laws on mold toxins in the grain of their animal feeds than we have on our human food here in the USA. It's a problem. Inflammatory food chemicals like these often cause a slow burn of inflammation. It's not enough to raise alarm bells with conventional medical doctors, but it's enough to slowly damage your arteries over many years. Then as you get older, you start to develop plaques in the arteries. And once again, if you're on statins, it takes longer for artery to plaque to develop in those cases. Does that mean you should be on statins? Well, if you want to eat cancer-causing bullshit diets, yes. You should probably get started on statins. If you eat relatively healthy and your cholesterol is below 300, you're generally fine here. Even if you have a cheat meal occasionally, you eat some nonsense, your body can recover from the damage without creating atherosclerosis, assuming you actually eat healthy, actually exercise, and you sleep. And since I mentioned sleep, even if you eat a perfect diet, extreme lack of sleep can put your body into a chronic state of inflammation. So prioritize your sleep if you haven't already. Your mental perception of stress can also cause inflammation and raise your overall risk of heart disease. So it's not just about what you eat and sleep and exercise, although most people's chronic inflammation does come from food. But it's worth noting that exercise helps your body recover from inflammation, so it's not an excuse to eat a poor diet, but exercise helps your body deal with the inevitable exposures of junk that we have in our modern food, our modern air quality, especially in the US. So what about testing for LDL instead of just total cholesterol? About 20 years ago, it was popular to say total cholesterol is not very accurate for predicting heart disease, so we need to look at LDL levels. LDL versus HDL ratios, things like that. Even back then, we knew the total cholesterol thing was useless, but Big Pharma pivoted and gave doctors another tool to continue to prescribe statins. LDL, HDL ratio. It sounded more scientific. People didn't know what it was, so they had to trust the doctor to do the right thing, which is always prescribe statin drugs. <laughs> By the way, the normal range for total cholesterol and blood tests used to be 300 and below, and today it's 200 and below. That number was changed almost overnight when Lipitor statin was invented. It wasn't because of some magical research study that showed 200 was somehow bad. Nina Teicholz wrote a book, a great book in 2014 called The Big Fat Surprise. Even then it was obvious that plaque in the arteries was caused by inflammation and not LDL, certainly not total cholesterol. Today it's very obvious LDL can be high for decades and you can have zero plaque in your arteries. I know a lot of people, a lot of good examples. Total cholesterol can be super, super high. You can have zero plaque for your lifetime. Uh, have you seen Dave Feldman's study? I uh, had him on my YouTube channel in 2017 before anyone had heard of him because I always stay on top of the cutting edge of this stuff. And Feldman recently looked at 548 people with super, super high cholesterol, like 500 on their cholesterol. And he's going to publish that soon. It's a multi-year study. The good news is these people aren't getting plaque in their arteries because their blood sugar is excellent and they exercise. But I've heard about the early data, which you're going to have to wait and see. He did publish a case report on one of these 548 people. And this guy had a total cholesterol over 500 for over two years. And he started with a zero plaque. Two years later, he still had zero plaque. CT angiogram conducted on this guy after... Over two years of hypercholesterolemia revealed no evidence of calcified or non-calcified plaque. Why? Because the people included in Feldman's study were healthy, eating lots of meat, tons of animal fat, but no seed oils. They were exercising, getting out in the sun, sleeping well, not overly stressed. These things are not trivial. This is the pattern you find when you stop lumping everyone together in huge groups and start defining healthy people as people with optimized blood sugar, where their fasted blood sugar is below 85, and their triglycerides are also below 85. Get picky on those two blood tests. They actually matter because they indicate whether your metabolism is healthy or not. You can still be unhealthy with optimized blood sugar. For example, if you smoke cigarettes and eat low carb, but it's a good starting point. Now, what about ApoB? It's hilarious to me here because this is the new fad started by Peter Tia. 
It's the new way of saying your total cholesterol is too high without saying your total cholesterol is too high. It's popular because it allows medical professionals to use another newfangled technical term that most people don't understand, so it makes them sound like experts. Yet it mainly tells you high, how high your cholesterol is. There's even recent research saying Currently, the substitution of ApoB for total cholesterol and cardiovascular disease prevention guidelines has been deemed unjustified. And these are generally people that want to push statin. So let's talk about some of the nuance related to this topic. Not everything, but some of it. And we'll circle back to this ApoB thing that the big pharma and guys like Peter T are promoting like crazy right now. And by the way, literally every one of Peter T's clients that I've spoken with over the years is on statins or, PKS, or PCSK9 inhibitors or other cholesterol lowering medication. They're all on prescription drugs. Apparently, he finds a lot of people that have a deficiency in pharma drugs. I don't, I don't see it. So one thing that's worth mentioning here, and anytime we talk about scientific terminology or science, it's a different language. You don't need to be extremely smart to understand it, but it's a different language. I have a friend who can speak Swahili. Shout out to Mahuli Dube. It's a cool language with literal pops and clicks similar to this. In my language, I will say, Any question? If not question, thank you. And see, I don't understand a single word of that. Does that mean people that speak Swahili or Zulu dialect, or they're all geniuses? Of course not. They're just speaking a language, same as we speak and understand the English language. Science is the same, it's a different language. So when people know this language, they like to separate themselves for the sake of their ego usually, and they speak in the most technical terms, like this biochemistry textbook. <clears throat> Histones interact with DNA to form periodic beads on a string structure called polynucleosomes, in which the elementary unit is, is a nucleosome. Each nucleosome is disc-shaped about 11 nanometers in diameter. Another example, these tail sequences appear to extend radially out from the histone core and may be involved in interactions between nucleosomes. The DNA is wrapped around the octamer uh, with the H3 to H4 core interacting with the central 70 to 80 base pairs of the surrounding DNA. You see, technical terminology. And they're just talking about what the, the physical protein that DNA wraps around. Topo here's another example. Topoisomerases make transient single strand breaks in a negatively supercoiled DNA double helix. Passage of the unbroken strand through the gap eliminates one supercoil from DNA. They're just talking about the way the DNA twists. You see, but it's very technical. See, it's gibberish to most people, but scientists are like, ah, I like your unique use of the luciferase assay for that research or your topo isomerase explanation. It's a different language. One of my few talents is to translate this language, simplify it so people can actually improve their health. That's probably why you're watching this video. But anyways, occasionally when I do DNA consults, I find people with legitimately, legitimate familiar, familial hypercholesterolemia. Their total cholesterol will be well over 500 and they do in fact get plaque in their arteries even as young as age 20 or 30 sometimes. Medical schools like to use those people as an example. Does this prove high cholesterol is bad? No, but it is how they teach docs in med school to believe that high cholesterol is bad. They basically have turned Brown and Goldstein, the Nobel Prize winners for studying hypercholesterolemia, they've basically canonized them in the religion of science. It's very dangerous, Chuck, because a lot of what you're seeing as attacks on me, quite frankly, are attacks on science, which are so ridiculous as 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 you know just painfully ridiculous now the reason people with super super high cholesterol do in fact get plaque at younger ages is because the cholesterol stays in their blood for too long their body can't clear it out and a lot of the cholesterol becomes oxidized oxidized cholesterol is inflammatory oxidized cholesterol can damage arteries even in cases where people have Low total cholesterol, when they have high oxidized cholesterol, it's very damaging to the artery lining. And you can check your oxidized cholesterol on a blood test. It's a worthwhile blood test if you're worried about these things. Some people have pristine heart disease genes, and even if they have fairly high oxidized LDL or they smoke cigarettes, their arteries are just so good at healing, they never develop any plaque or atherosclerosis. But some people are much more on a hair trigger for developing these things. 
But remember, it's always inflammation. Now another blood test that can be useful is LPA, lipoprotein A. Most people just call it LPA or LP little a, but LPA is basically a piece of cholesterol that can, in fact, damage arteries. Conventional doctors like to look at LPA sometimes because it often correlates with total cholesterol. In other words, if your cholesterol is high, your LPA is usually high if you're eating a lot of seed oils from potato chips and corn chips and all that. But be careful interpreting LPA. LPA variation is extremely genetic. Some people have a disposition toward higher LPA if they have higher inflammation, and some people just don't. If your LPA is high, I suggest try B3, vitamin B3. It's also called niacin or niacinamide. Try those supplements because there are studies showing this works, and I suggest intermittent fasting. That increases autophagy, the process where your cells clear out garbage, they take out the trash. I also recommend donating blood. It's like changing your oil. It can lower your LPA. Sunshine's another one that can help. It breaks up aggregates and clumps of garbage in your body. But remember, everyone's different. Gluten might be causing inflammation or nightshades or mold or whatever, and that's triggering your tendency to have higher LPA. And this is a good time to bring up another confounding factor related to ApoB. ApoB is the protein that wraps around LDL, VLDL, IDL, also LPA. So if your LPA is high, your ApoB goes up. And this is a legitimate risk of damage to your arteries from the inflammation from the LPA. So I'll give you two cases to illustrate this ApoB thing. One person has high LDL and therefore high ApoB, but they're healthy like Dave Feldman's two-year study. They have high ApoB, but zero artery plaque, artery damage, zero plaque. The next person has high LPA and therefore high ApoB and has a bunch of artery plaque. If you lump enough people together, you'll start to see that people with higher ApoB have more plaque in their arteries because of that LPA connection and other types of inflammation. Then should you blame it on ApoB or total cholesterol or LDL particle size or LDL versus HL? No, it's LPA and other types of inflammation. And here's another layer to this problem. When studies have been done to see if different scientists can replicate peer-reviewed research, they're only successful about 10% of the time. This means there are at least some flaws in about 90% of studies, which I would say is very true. I've worked in the cholesterol field long enough where I see published research from certain labs and I say, oh yeah, I know that guy, he does sloppy work. It's like an auto mechanic, right? Or a house building contractor. Some of them are good, some of them are just terrible. But Peter Tia picks up on it and bases an entire podcast on it. And you might also not know there's that scientists choose their own peer reviewers for peer reviewed research so that further deepens the problem as long as you have an md or phd you can pick your own peer reviewers you can get just about anything published if you really want to it's political and then you get the guys that argue cholesterol is a problem because i have this one study and it says this one thing it's likely to be a poorly done study or just a biased uh, interpretation now biostaticians also biostaticians will tell you they can use math to basically find significance in anything so if you set out looking for a headline, like cholesterol is bad or ApoB is linked to heart disease, you can shoehorn your mathematical model to support that idea. Especially knowing that LPA raises ApoB, inflammation in general can raise uh, LPA, and like smoking, right, and all this confounding nonsense, it's a mess. So even the pharmaceutical company leaders are complaining about the lack of reproducibility and the lack of reliability in scientific research, by the way. They say it's about 75% of studies are BS. And it's making it harder for them to develop drugs because they can't even trust a lot of the science is reliable. So that should give you at least some idea on how, how to think through the topic of cholesterol, or at least my perspective on it. Eventually, maybe I'll make a two-hour video on this, but unlike guys like Peter T, who have a huge staff of writers and researchers because he charges outrageous money for his clients, I do this all myself. I have zero staff as I'm making this, but it's a mess out there. There's plenty of amazing research. In general, if the research doesn't promote prescription drugs or some agenda like vegan diets or vaccines or vax passports, it's much more reliable data in my opinion. When money is heavily involved, just be skeptical. And I suggest to keep eating that saturated fat the way your ancestors did for thousands of years. Spend more energy focusing on blood tests that actually matter, triglycerides, blood glucose, maybe other ones based on your DNA, not just cholesterol or ApoB. If you worry about your arteries, do a DNA consult. We'll see if you have anything unusual or legitimately concerning, and we'll go from there. It's that simple.